Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning. And we have a special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Spring Cut Clark County area, we're looking for a new church home in place in St. John. <coughs> Today is Christ the King Sunday. That means this is the last Sunday of this church here. Next Sunday will be the first Sunday in Advent, the beginning of the new church here. And with next week, the first Sunday in Advent, we go to Series A, which means the predominant gospel readings throughout the year will be from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, this past year, the gospel readings have mostly come from the Gospel of Luke. So now, at the beginning of Advent, we switch to the Gospel of Matthew. That said, you please turn to page 94 in the front of your worship book. And as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, we order confession and forgiveness. And I invite those who can do so without difficulty to please stay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Clean the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. St. John's God Lutheran Church. Service. Everything is in your bulletin except for uh, the final hymn, which you will need to read the hymn book for again for that. The opening hymn when we all get to heaven is on the back of the This is November the 20th, 2016, Christ the King Sunday. Their hymn is When We All Get to Heaven. It was written by Eliza E. Hewitt, one of the most famous, most wonderful premier women hymn writers of the late 1800s and early 1900s. This is a song about heaven written by Eliza E. Hewitt, an American woman songwriter.
Diane Myers will do the reading today.
glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, with joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. St. John's Lutheran Church, November the 20th, Christ the King Sunday. We now hear the gospel for Christ the King Sunday.
Each week he continues to serve out more and more families, giving up more and more food. Uh, there seems to be more and larger families coming uh, than ever. So please join us Tuesday evening, invite your family and friends, and bring those non-perishable food items. And the last um, announcement is an invitation. You see it on the last page of your bulletin. For several years now, the Linden family has had their Thanksgiving here at the church. Uh, and it is open to anyone who does not have somewhere to go for Thanksgiving uh, or anyone to eat with. They invite you to join them. Uh, they will eat around 1 o'clock. And Becky's Democrat's number is there in the world that you can call and let her know that you are coming. Uh, she says, if you forget, uh, and you come to Thursday, you have nowhere to go, still show up because they'll have plenty of food. So our thanks to the victims and that gracious invitation to everyone. <coughs> now, I ask that you give your attention to our report.
fun in the bulletin. And as you were doing that, one other announcement I should have made in regards to our kitchen crew and all the work they do, they could use help on Tuesdays. Uh, we always have plenty of help on Friday for Rainbow Day, but Tuesdays we've lost a couple of people due to changes in their physical condition and so forth. So if you have time on Tuesday, they could help with the feeding of the koalas on Tuesday. Please let Sally know, and I'm sure she can find something for you to do. Uh, but Friday, we went, I mean, I walk down the hall, and people will come, will come up and go, where is the rainbow table? I want to help. I'm like, you never saw the person before, but it's like, come out and look. And Tuesday, we can use some help. So, have Tuesday available anytime between 9 and 1. Uh, your help would be greatly appreciated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the King of the Jews. So said the inscription above our Lord Jesus Christ's head as he was nailed to the cross that first Good Friday. And that inscription was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin so that anyone passing by or anyone gathering to observe the spectacle would be able to read the charge for which Jesus was being crucified. When Pontius Pilate had that inscription put above the head of Jesus, he was doing so in order to mock the Jewish authorities who had demanded so vehemently that Jesus be put to death. And he also did it to ridicule the idea that Jesus was any kind of king. This inscription made to antagonize the enemies of Pontius Pilate, brought about various reactions. Reactions illustrated by the crowd, by the religious rulers, and by the thief, the penitent thief, on one of the crosses, crucified with Jesus. So as we bring this church here to a close, celebrating the Sunday known as Christ the King, it gives to us a question or a challenge, and that is, where do you stand when it comes to Jesus Christ? Do you stand on the side that Christ is King? Do you stand on the side that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord and Savior of the world, that He is the way, the truth, and the life, that He did by His death upon that cross make payment for the sin that you commit and that payment that you owe to God, that he is the way of salvation, that it comes to him as a gift and is not earned by our own doing or effort. Or are you on, do you make a stand that Jesus was just another prophet in a long line of prophets beginning with Moses? Or do you look at Jesus as just another religious figure in a long line of hysteric, historical religious figures like Confucius and Buddha, and Moses and Muhammad? Or do you stand on the side that Jesus was just another philosopher in that great line of Greek and Roman philosophers that we study in school and some of their ideas are part of the foundation of our nation and our culture? Or do you stand on the side that Jesus was just another great moralist, another great teacher, but that was it? This day, Christ the King gives you that challenge of where do you stand and gives you the opportunity to answer. So we begin by looking at the first group who was at the cross. And the question is, do you stand with the crowd? Crowd was the first group that makes a reaction. St. Luke records these words concerning the crowd, quote, and the people stood by watching in the group. That word watching means to gaze upon something. It means to observe something. It means to be a spectator, but not necessarily to gaze upon or observe or to be a spectator with any kind of passion or any kind of feeling. You're just 
there because it's there for you to look at, and you might as well look at it as anything else. It's not like being a spectator at a ball game where you have a vested interest in one team or the other winning. It's more of your everyday life where you can observe things, but they don't really affect you. You really have no feeling. So the crowd is just kind of blasé. They're just there. After all, crucifixions and public executions were entertainment to some people. Even in the history of our own nation, when communities used to publicly execute people, you can see old photographs and read accounts of those execution drawing group crowds. And there would be vendors selling things. And there would be preachers there preaching for people to repent. And people would observe that execution. Some would be family members of the one being executed. They had an interest. Some would be victims of the one being executed. So they had an interest. But the majority of the crowd was just there for the entertainment. There for the social event. There's nothing else going on in town. And so to sit by and just watch is not exactly something that is unusual to us. As we go through our daily life, we oftentimes just watch. So just as there were those in the crowd at Gagatha that first Good Friday who were simply watching, who were just spectators, there are people today who continue to be spectators both in the church and out of the church. There are people who will hear the gospel message. They hear the Holy Spirit tugging at their hearts to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. But they will not really for one reason or another. They will hear that invitation and just turn it deaf in. Such people are content to let each day go by not worrying about their soul, not worrying about their not worrying about what might lie beyond the grave. These people, however, will oftentimes turn in to a Christian program on the radio or watch a Christian a service on TV and they will be sometimes moved and marvel at the music and the pageantry, especially in a Christmas Eve service or a Holy Week service for the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Sunday. But even though they may marvel at that, even though they may be impressed by the music, or even though they may be impressed by what they see, they still will not make that commitment. They still just watch. Likewise, there are those in the church who simply who are just spectators of the life of the church, but in a different manner. They have made a stand for Jesus Christ. They do accept God's free gift of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They do claim the promises that God has made through Jesus Christ. They believe in salvation by grace and faith apart from the of the law. They do believe in the atoning death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. They do believe that Jesus' resurrection and ascension assures us that this was God's plan of salvation and we now have victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. But that's as far as it goes with themselves. They believe it for themselves. They confess it for themselves. But they do nothing else with it. That's the extent of their involvement in the church. As far as the work of the local congregation or the work of the national or international church, they just watch from the sidelines. Sometimes impressed by what the church is doing, but still just watching. Watching either because they think they have no gifts to give the church. Even though scripture tells us over and over again that when you Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit gives you at least one spiritual gift to use within the community of faith. A gift to use to bolster the community of faith, to make the community of faith stronger, to help 
spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But for some reason, these people do not hear that message. And so they think, well, I have nothing to offer the church. Or they're not active because they just don't want to become involved. They're afraid if they involve themselves in the church, then they might be involved in having to vote on something that is rather contentious in the congregation, or they might be asked to serve in some capacity in which they wouldn't want to serve, and so they just watch. Watch instead of using their gifts to promote the good news of Jesus Christ. The early church spread throughout the Roman Empire, not because the followers of Jesus gathered up an army and went about the Mediterranean world saying, convert or die, but the early church spread it because once one became a Christian, they were so excited that they were now free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. They couldn't wait to share it with some a family member or friend or co-worker who didn't know of that good news. And so they would tell them, come and see. Come and join me and see what I have received so that you might receive it too. The church did not spread because of St. Peter and Paul, St. James and John, St. Bartholomew and Andrew and Thomas. Because many of those followers, the early disciples and apostles of Jesus, were executed within the first 10 years of the Christian church. <coughs> and so it was the regular people that were needed to spread the good news. Yes, St. Paul planted many churches. He was the greatest missionary and church planter in the history of the Christian faith. But still, he could not do it alone. And those churches could not survive with his absence unless he had appointed people there who took up the work and encouraged then others to take up the work so that the church could be strong. And remember when I was serving in Griffith, Indiana, where I was before I came here. And I was talking to an older pastor. Or one that seemed older to me at that time. He didn't seem so old now, but at that time he seemed older. And we were in the discussion at the Indiana Kentucky Senate Assembly. And he said to me, he said, John, he said, do you have any idea where this term inactive members came from? He said, you know, if you look at the New Testament, you never see the phrase inactive members. He said, all the members were out there. They were all busy helping one another. They were all busy spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. They were busy comforting the poor and the sick and setting up the first hospitals and the first inns and doing all these things to help one another and to help society in general. He said, I don't understand these people who put their, role, their name on a roll in a church and then they never dark at the door of the church again. He says, you know, just having your name on a roll in a church somewhere isn't salvation. He said, that name on a roll isn't going to guarantee you anything. You have to have that active faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done. And so there are those within the church who are even spectators and who will not put forth the support that the church needs in order to continue to spread the good news to those who have been hurt. The second group that you can stand with are the religious leaders. The rulers gathered at the crucifixion of Jesus, though they represent the scoffers and the sinners. St. Luke says of them, quote, the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. That word scoff means to deride somebody. It means to sneer at them out. It means to scorn them. Here were the religious leaders of the Jewish people. The religious leaders who should have known that Moses and the prophets and what they had said about the coming Messiah. They should have recognized right off the bat that Jesus was who he said he was. But Jesus was turning everything upside down. Jesus was destroying the status quo. Jesus was saying faith was more important than the temple. 
Jesus was saying faith and action was more important than outward signs of obedience through all the rules and rituals of Judaism. Jesus was saying that when it comes to people versus the law, you act on behalf of people. And the religious leaders couldn't have that. The law is the way they control the people. Jesus comes through and busts up their business in the temple of selling the sheep and cows and doves needed to sacrifice, turns over the table of the money changers, the religious leaders were losing income. And so instead of supporting Jesus, instead of standing with Jesus, they scoff at him. And they ridicule him. And they mock him. And they speak ill of God's plan of salvation. Since the church began, this has been a common pattern in society. To mock, to scoff at, to ridicule the message of the Christian faith. On that very first Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit came upon and descended upon the apostles in the upper room and they ran down into the streets of Jerusalem and began to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified, scoffers in the crowd that gathered tried to claim that the disciples were drunk and that the people shouldn't listen to them. But St. Peter picks up that challenge and, says, and confronts those scoffers and says, how could we be drunk and be out here preaching? So if we were drunk, if we'd been carousing all night and drinking, we would still be sleeping it off. It's far too early in the morning for any drunk to be up and proclaiming the good news. There are still those who are like the rulers, who want to scoff, who want to ridicule, who want to mock. For whatever reason, these are the people who allow Satan to use their hearts and minds as his playground, and therefore they refuse to listen to the gospel message. They ignore the gifts of eternal life, and so they suffer the consequences. Scoffers and the cynics are not the people you want to stand. Which brings us to that third group, and that is the sinners, represented by the thief on the cross. Church tradition has given this thief the name Dismas because he represents those who understand the true meaning of the inscription, this is the king of the Jews. He realizes that standing before God, one has nothing with which to bargain with God. One has nothing to claim, make a claim on God. No one has anything that they can free themselves from God's wrath with of their own doing. And so all this was can do is throw himself on the mercy of Jesus Christ. And hope that God will accept Jesus for his crimes and sins. He represents those who realize that earning salvation is a worthless attempt. That that attempt is like a bunch of dirty rags in the face of an almighty and holy God. So he asked Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. He confesses the Lord as Lord recognizes him as God's son and Jesus gives him that mercy which not only results in his salvation but in his promise of being with Jesus for all eternity. It is with the thief that we should stand. It is with the thief that we stand as we too acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and we accept willingly that mercy that he bestows upon us. Imagine back to that first good Friday, with that heat beating down on the three men being crucified. All the pain and suffering that we read happens to one who is crucified. The gasping for air, the pain, not being able to Settle yourself in a position that brings a relief to the pain that you have. Here, dismiss and all that pain and suffering. 
hears Jesus speak to him the most comforting words probably that had ever been spoken in the pages of history. And Jesus says to him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Truly, that word literally means so be it. So Jesus is making a command, so be it. I say to you today, that means this very day. Doesn't mean thousands of years down the road. It means this very day, you will be with me in paradise. And this shows us, as one theologian has said, paradise is not achievable, but receivable. So you receive paradise. We can't achieve it. We can't earn it. Here this thief, this brigand, this highway robber, this insurrectionist, this enemy to the Roman Empire, this man who lived a life of crime and sin, on his deathbed, reaches out to Jesus asking for mercy and forgiveness and is granted that promise of eternity on that day. Another theologian has said, paradise is being with Jesus. It doesn't matter if we're with Jesus in this earth, holy life, or whether we're with Jesus in eternity. Wherever we are with Jesus, we are in paradise. And that is where we want to stay. As Jesus spoke those words to this was on that good, first Good Friday, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. He speaks them to you today. He speaks them to everyone who hears the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is a promise to all those who will stand with him. The inscription read, this is a king of the Jews. The designation for this last Sunday in the church year is... Christ the King. Where do you stand? Do you stand with the spectators? Do you stand with the scoffers? Or do you stand with the sinners, with the thief, and receive that promise? Where do you stand? The decision is yours to make. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Those who can, please rise. Please join me as we confess our faith in the words of the night scene of the evening. We believe in one God. Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all who is seen and unseen, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in the words of the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord to give our life, who proceeds from Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to prophets, who we believe in one and one Catholic and Apostolic Church, who we acknowledge one baptism with the gifts of sins, who we look for the resurrection of the dead and life in the world to come. Amen. Awaiting the fulfillment of God's reign, let us pray for the world, the church, and all the people according to their needs. 
Our response today is hear our prayer. Shepherds of Israel, guide those who tend their, their flocks. Be with the leaders of your church as they gather your people in safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator of the universe, we ask your forgiveness for all those times that when we have been poor stewards of your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of speech and song, give us courage in our words that together, with all who have written of your glory, we might forever proclaim your praises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our help and trouble, bring healing and comfort to those who are sick and those who are dying and peace to those who mourn the passing of those they love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King of glory, with the thief on the cross and all the holy saints who have gone before us, we look forward to that day when we will be with you in paradise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayers, righteous God. We await the coming of your great and glorious feast. Through Christ, your beloved Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 Time for our offering. Mike and Debbie Cochran are the ushers today. This is November the 20th, Christ the King Sunday, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Flowers today are given to the glory of God, presented by Linda Fox in honor of the birthdays of son Byron, grandson Chase, and great-granddaughter Olivia. Also by Les and Cindy Pearson and family in honor of Becky Bishop for her birthday and in memory of Bill and Barbara DeSellum for their anniversary. These are the flowers that you can see on the chancel stands today. We have live flowers every Sunday. We welcome you. This is the 20th of November. Christ the King Sunday. Next Sunday we'll begin Advent as we'll celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ to bring love into the world. The gospel in one word is love. We invite you to participate in our service. We have services at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. every Sunday. 9.15 is Sunday school and 6.30. Usually we have in the chapel the service, but this coming week Thanksgiving service will be Tuesday. The rest of the time, 6.30 p.m. we have Holy Communion every Wednesday night. We welcome you to come to worship with us. Mike and Debbie Cochran now bringing forward the offering. This is Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of the church year, and next Sunday we'll begin Advent. We invite you to come to our Thanksgiving service this week on Tuesday. We also invite you to participate in the rainbow table and to bring uh, gifts by the 12th of December for uh, the children who come to the rainbow table, donations. Bring in gently used blankets and coats for the rainbow, Christmas hats, scarves, gloves. Tags for the angel tree gifts are on the tree in the atrium. Items for the rainbow, Christmas, and angel tree gifts must be at the church by December the 12th.
For all those who are baptized and believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, who believe his body and blood are truly present as we gather at his table, and our communion agent and our own individual congregation, we invited and encouraged to come forward with us this day as we gather at the table of the Lord. We continue our celebration with a great thanksgiving on page 6 in your book. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God.
body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his precious blood, strengthen, preserve your true faith and the life eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the truth of men bread from heaven. Your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, grant that we who have received the truth of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. We conclude our celebration with the crowning of many crowns, hymn number 855, in the back of your worship. Hymn number 855. This hymn was written in 1851 by two clergymen, Matthew Bridges, who wrote Catholic verses, and Godfrey Thring, who wrote Protestant verses. This Anglican minister, Godfrey Thring, and a Catholic priest, Matthew Bridges, crown him with many crowns. This is an ecumenical hymn in honor of Christ the King Sunday, Jesus Christ. Some of the verses were written by Matthew Bridges, some by Godfrey Thring, 1851 English hymn.
watching us on YouTube, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We invite you to come worship with us this coming Tuesday at uh, our church. We'll have our Thanksgiving service, bring non-perishable foods. And then if you want to bring some uh, gifts for our rainbow table, blankets, scarves, and find the tree at our church that gives what the children need. We're happy to bring you this service. We offer a Christian school program. We're hoping to start again in January. Please tune again in at any time. We thank you for joining us in our worship this Lord's Day. We hope and we pray that God will continue to bless you and we will pray for you. Pray for our ministry. This is the 20th of November, Christ the King Sunday. And we'll start next Sunday, will be the first Sunday of Advent. So we invite you to come worship with us every Sunday for Advent and Wednesday evenings for Holy Communion in the chapel. We have the rainbow table on Fridays. Come help us with that. We serve food to anyone who is in need. We also need somebody to help us on Tuesdays. We're also serving food to the Qantas Club on Tuesday. So come to the church and help us anytime. We can use your help in serving for others. Rainbow table, providing food, clothing, whatever is needed in our community. Love your neighbor as yourself and your neighbor as anyone who is in need.